Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. An unconventional presidential uh, president-elect in the Philippines, one who's been likened in some ways uh, to Donald Trump for uh, his style. On substance, a little bit different, say our panelists. We're talking about it with a former member of the Philippines House of Representatives, uh, Walden Bello of the left-wing Akbayan Party. Joining, He's joining us from Bangkok. Welcome back as well to uh, Nicole Corrado in Manila. She's a sociologist at the University of Canberra and here in the studio from the French Political Science Institute, Sciences Po David Camru. Uh, welcome. Before the break, we were talking about uh, the uh, uh, proposals made by the uh, president-elect uh, Rodrigo Duterte. Another one of those proposals, uh, and I'll put it to, to you first, Nicole Corrado, is this idea of a constitutional convention to devolve more power to the provinces. Uh, uh, Duterte, uh, who is uh, calling for less power for himself? Right. Um, one could say that. Um, in fact, even before the um, electoral race happened, and Mayor Duterte has been known to be a strong supporter for federalism. Um, in fact, this has been almost like his blanket solution for a lot of problems in the Philippines. So, for example, on the issue of insurgency in southern Philippines, he would say that what we actually need is to give them um, more powers for them to control their own resources, for them to control their own um, police and peace and order situation. I anticipate that it will be a very um, contentious process um, because a lot of power holders are at stake. Uh, one of the issues initially raised um, in the issue of federalism is that even if you um, spread powers across different regions, ultimately the beneficiaries of this are local warlords and local political dynasties. So in a way, um, it's not just an issue of principle on how the government of the Philippines should be structured, but it's also an issue of how this will look like in practice, um, considering that the, the political landscape has still been largely exclusionary. So yeah, that is a big debate on the principle and on the pragmatics of having a federal form of government. David Cameron on the campaign trail, I know that uh, his opponents said, oh, uh, Duterte uh, has a strongman penchant. Watch out, it could be a return to the years of the Marcos dictatorship if he wins. With this proposal for a constitutional convention, for more devolution, does that prove those opponents wrong? I think so, because uh, the, the Philippines has the worst of both worlds. It's got an American-style presidential system, but with modifications. There is a one-round um, election, so there's no runoff. So Duterte has been elected with about 40%, over 40% of the vote, which was the case for his predecessor, uh, Aquino. But other presidents have been elected with 25%. So he's elected without really a, you know, a majority mandate. 40% yeah, considered a landslide. Yeah, but well, you know, the Philippines have lessons to give us in democracy. Eighty-two percent of them did go out and vote. You know, which is which is really quite extraordinary. Uh, very high participation rate. Um, but also in the Philippines, we have a Senate which is nationally elected. Now, usually, a Senate is there to represent local interests. Now. Um, so that the idea of some kind of devolution, there is he, he, Duterte is responding to a real demand from the, from the grassroots, which is the, the, the notion of an imperial Manila, where all power is in the hands of Manila. Uh, and the, but of course, the fear about, as, as uh, has just been mentioned, about devolving is this will give more power to, to local oligarchs, uh, because the same people who are also the economic oligarchs are also the political oligarchs. I mean, 80 percent of the Filipino Congress is made up of dyna political dynasties, members of political dynasties. And so that is the fear about devolution. Uh, and that fear is, is quite, quite real. For example, in the vice presidential campaign, the vice president is elected separately. Uh, the son of Ferdinand Marcos, the former dictator, is running neck and neck in second place for the vice presidential position. So we could end up, you know, I hope it looks unlikely to happen, but there's a possibility you could up with two authoritarian individuals uh, in charge of the Philippines. Now, um, what's interesting to watch is the markets here. ANZ Banking Group sees the country's GDP expanding 6.1% this year and a whopping 7.6% estimated this quarter. There's the graph showing you uh, how the Filipino peso has uh, risen uh, uh, with the prospect of that Duterte victory. Uh, the, uh, the, this is an interesting point because you were mentioning before the break, David Cameron, about how there's this 
growth, which uh, uh, we haven't seen in other parts of, uh, of Asia, 6.1% is, is, is high growth. And, and yet uh, you're saying that uh, that's not trickling down, even though a lot of that growth is based on remittances and uh, people sending money back? 10% uh, of GDP comes from remittances, so those people have benefited. But they're the aspiring lower middle class that I'm talking about who, who feel frustrated. Uh, and the Philippines has one of the most unequal, Gini uh, is one of the most unequal countries of, of, of Asia, even more unequal th th than China. So there's, there's this frustration and anger from, uh, you know, from the aspiring class who their situation has improved a little bit, but they've seen the situation of the very rich improve considerably. Uh, Walden Bello, uh, the Philippines, would you say that uh, uh, the, the lot of its people is improving? You were mentioning earlier to us that high poverty rate in the country. Uh, no. Um, again, I would agree with Mr. Cameron uh, that, uh, that uh, you have a situation of high growth, um, but uh, continuing high inequality and the poverty rate remains at 26 to 28 percent of the population. This is statistics that um, really uh, is, is the same as in the early 1990s. And I think this was one of the things that backfired on the Aquino administration because it would continually say that, oh, wow, well, we've got this uh, 6 to 7 percent per annum growth rate, and isn't that great? And uh, and then the people would say, oh, yes, there's growth, but it's not coming to us. Therefore, it's just going to some other people, uh, you know, just a very few people in the population. So, you know, that's the sort of thing that backfired uh, very badly on the administration, claiming growth, but, uh, uh, but the, the growth wasn't there, and therefore people said it was just going to the oligarchs, to a few rich people. So... Um, I think that um, I think that uh, there's a lot of expectations, um, you know, from uh, across the board, but especially among the lower class and the lower middle class, uh, for Mr. Duterte to deliver. And uh, this is why I think that, uh, of course, his uh, his transition team would say that stability, continuity. But I have a feeling that um, he is uh, going to be under a lot of pressure to take a lot of populist measures uh, to ease the income distribution and get uh, you know to get more people out of poverty. So I think we should be expecting. What, what do you mean by populist measures? Well, uh, more um, uh, income uh, redistribution measures that really bite um, uh, and, uh, you know, um, agrarian reform, definitely. Uh, he has to deliver on that. And, um, and I, I mentioned, uh, you know, the whole question of contractualization and the need for regular work. This will be a very strong bone of contention that will pit uh, management against that is pitting labor and management, and uh, there will be a lot of pressure on Duterte to take labor's side on this issue, especially since the last several administrations have been so pro so, foreign investment and pro management. So, but I, I was going to so I was so we were saying we were showing earlier how the markets like the fact that he's won, but you're you're making it sound a bit like um, he's closer to Hugo Chavez than to Donald Trump. Well, as I well as I'm I'm saying, um, you know this, you know when you when you see this appointments that he makes um, or the announcement that he has made that four very important um, uh, positions in the cabinet will be going to the Communist Party of the Philippines, uh, I think that indicates, you know, that that uh, he will be moving left uh, on on economic policy. Now, I think. Uh, Again, the debate is on right now uh, on whether there's going to be continuity or there will be uh, radical measures. And I think that um, I think that let's wait and see, you know, in the next few months where he is really going to be headed on this score. Uh, the, the Nikkei Asian Review saw him as one of the most business-friendly of the candidates, which is kind of paradoxical with his left-wing rhetoric. And the reaction of the business community in the last week would suggest that, uh, and some of his appointments would suggest, that he'll be pro-foreign investment. So he would be trying to play two games at the same time, a more populist redistributive game, but at the same time welcoming greater foreign investment. 
Speaking of foreigners, it's time to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, disputes that have been brewing in this, all the tension in the South China Sea. Now, the Philippines had the U.S. shut down its big military base at Subic Bay back in 1992. But last month, the United States started joint patrols with the Philippines Navy, and this while Duterte was pledging to jet ski to the Spratlys and plant the Fino Filipino flag on islands disputed by China. There you see the Spratlys are, are those groupings of islands that are uh, in, around that dotted circle you see at the bottom uh, of your screen. And uh, the question is, we're hearing two different things uh, from, from, uh, from Duterte. Uh, uh, on the one hand, he's talking about jet skiing uh, Nicole Corrado. Uh, on the other, he's talking about sitting down with the Chinese and bargaining face to face. Right. Actually, this is the area where the president elect Duterte could actually give us more clarity. We're starting to get used to his jokes and his rhetoric on national policy. We're starting to have a sense of how, you know, we can actually appreciate his um, tongue in cheek comments. But this is exactly one facet where he has to actually um, be more specific with what, with, with what he wants to happen. So just today, I think one of the first envoys that he met in Davao City um, is a Chinese ambassador. And um, so it feels like he is still trying to um, make sure we have we continue to have good relationships with China. Um, in, in, the, in the campaign season, of course, he had, yes, he did talk about jet skiing to one of the contested territories, but he also did make um, a, a very specific position that he will pursue um, the, current, um, the current case that we have with INCLOS, although he did also mention today that he'd be open with bilateral talks with China. So I guess um, I'm not a political out insider, so it's still a lot of wait and see at the moment. Um, he did assign an agri uh, a foreign affairs secretary, although it's a temporary um, appointment. So it's still a wait and see in terms of um, which personalities he will get um, advice when it comes to foreign policy. Walden Bello, if, you're, if you were a betting man, would you say that uh, he's uh, going to have a warming of relations with China or are they going to cool even further? Well, um, let me just say that I, I think uh, Duterte uh, distrusts the Americans more than the uh, Chinese. And I think that comes from his exposure to, uh, you know, uh, progressive left uh, um, pro uh, uh, viewpoints, uh, especially since when he was in, in college. And I think he's maintained that warm kind of openness to progressive viewpoints, uh, and 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 so uh, I think that there will be less of uh, uh, of the kind of very closeness with the United States that the Aquino administration has um, has adopted. Does that mean I those joint patrols with the U.S. are in doubt? I would say yes. I I would say that it could even go as far as that at this point in time. I I, I think that uh, uh, there certainly will be a greater openness to dealing with the Chinese. Um, uh, I think you've got to realize here that uh, basically um, the 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 Aquino administration's uh, policy, uh, you know, was associated with the former. Uh, foreign secretary uh, of, of, of the Philippines. And uh, that was sort of uh, seen by many as a unidimensional kind of policy that you know, the, the Philippines uh, without really any re reciprocal kind of benefits for the Philippines and most of it going to the United States. So I think Duterte will try to write that uh, balance uh, to, to to achieve a, a greater balance when it comes to this, and I think there will be not certainly a cooling off, but more of a distancing from the kind of very pro-American position of the Aquino administration. All right, uh, Duterte has talked of jet skiing, but he also recently told uh, the Chinese, "Build us a railway, just like the one you built in Africa, and let's set aside disagreements for a while." End quote. As for Beijing. Uh, David Cameron likes the idea of putting aside arbitration uh, over those disputed islands for bilateral talks, while also warning last week, and there's the quote, China will never bully small countries, but we will in no way tolerate small countries making up excuses and hurting China's interests. Now, it doesn't say that it's the Philippines they're referring to, but it sure sounds like it.
And the arbitration is going to go ahead, and it's likely to go in the favor of, of the Philippines on the status of these uh, man-made islands. Uh, so that Duterte will be in a position of greater strength, but also the Philippines will have the presidency of ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, uh, next year, which will also give them a, a, a greater position of strength. So, yes, I, I, I perhaps disagree with... Uh, with uh, Walden Bellow, in so far as there is a very strong nationalist sentiment in, uh, in, in the Philippines, and Duterte has to take that into account. And if the Chinese continue their sort of more assertive policies, that is likely to create a, 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 a backlash in public opinion, which, which you will you know, definitely tune into, I uh, would think. A backlash in public opinion, but when I was researching for the show, uh, we, we stumbled across the fact that when the US left Subic Bay, it was the end of a foreign military presence in the Philippines, which had stretched back to the 16th century. So uh, th there must be a lot of Filipinos who also look at, with wariness at the fact that uh, here's the U.S. coming back in a... Filipino attitudes to the United States are ambiguous. Uh, they would, there are some who would like the Philippines to be the 51st state. There are millions of Filipinos working and living in the United States, uh, strong links with Filipino-Americans. And at the same time, particularly on the left, there is a sort of an anti-American sentiment. So, you know, there is a sort of a balancing between those two. Uh, you know, the adversary of my adversary becomes my friend uh, in that context. And if the U.S., which plays the gendarme of the Pacific, is going to play that kind of role, uh, then, uh, and the Chinese become more assertive, then I would, I would expect the Filipinos will, will strengthen their reliance with the United States, not weaken it. All right, Nicole Corrado, uh, what's your sentiment on all of this? Uh, are Filipinos... Uh, happy or unhappy with uh, the concept of an Asia pivot by the United States in, in, in the face of uh, those claims by China and their in, in growing territorial waters that they've created with these artificial islands? Right. Actually, um, there has been a, a, a poll before where Filipinos actually, uh, there's, there's the ranking where Filipinos predominantly like the U.S. I think 85% of the Filipino population have positive sentiments towards the, towards the U.S. Although we have to read that with caution because you're absolutely right in pointing out that when there are issues related to American presence in the Philippines, then that sentiment can actually change, particularly in relation to campaigns that left-wing and progressive movements um, create. So one example here would be the rape case of one um, transgender woman in the Philippines. So that has been a very contentious issue. And there were, there were a lot of demands in making sure that the American serviceman um, is held into account. And these are precisely the allies that Rodrigo Duterte would want to bring into his cabinet, these members of progressive political movements. So I would agree that there would be a lot of balancing act required here, especially because the composition of Rodrigo Duterte's cabinet and his administration will be a hodgepodge of very different interests. So it's hard to speculate at this point on which voice among these very diverse interests would triumph in the course of his administration. All right. And how has that sentiment changed over the past five years as we've seen uh, China's uh, regional ambitions grow. Right. It's hard. It's hard to track that. I would have yet to see a survey that actually tracks Filipino sentiments um, in in relation to China. So at the moment, what what I would say would be. Um, it still has a lot to do with how um, the, the case in UNCLOS is pursued, and especially in relation to how Duterte would have some economic diplomacies with China. Um, he mentioned how Philippines and China would have could have possibly um, joint projects together when it comes to infrastructure. So that's one possibility. But again, it's still it's still up in the air. It's hard to speculate at this point. Walden Bello, do you take David Camus' point that uh, here you have a president-elect who can talk up uh, good relations? Uh, with Beijing while quietly waiting for that arbitration in his favor when it comes to those artificial islands? Uh, yes, I would think so. Um, you know, I, I think I think Duterte has a chance of, you know, um, basically, yes, I think he he has already said, you know, that, you know, that the arbitration process is something that he uh, favors. And uh, I think also that he also has a chance right now to have a more balanced policy, uh, uh, especially with respect to uh, China and um, uh, moving away from the, 
you know the 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 the, the you know the way that that Aquino completely went overboard when it comes to, uh, to the United States alliance. But at the same time, I think he'll you know he'll he'll try to to, to, to is it going overboard role. when China makes claims on the Spratly Islands? No, no. I what I, what I guess what I meant there, you know, was you know that he would try to have a more conciliatory thing with respect to China. But at the same time, I think he'll be very aware, as David Cameron said, uh, and you said, you know, that um, there is this uh, strong feeling in the Philippines about resent resentment about what China is doing. So he's going to have. Uh, to play this this diplomatic game fairly carefully, and the kind of response that he made during the presidential debate that he'll go and plant the flag and leave it up to the Chinese to determine his fate well that's that was great theatrics, but i I, I think it's going to be a much 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 more complicated, but he has a chance to have uh, to to hew another line here after the Aquino administration's line of a complete embrace of the United States. David Cameron? Also, there is the possibility of relying on the Japanese. We always forget the Japanese. And he met the Japanese ambassador as well. This yes, Monday. indeed. And the Japanese have substantial investment in the Philippines. They're involved in infrastructure pro projects. And throughout Southeast Asia, the Japanese are making a very quiet but effective efforts in public diplomacy and investment to kind of contribute to the balancing that all of the Southeast Asian political leaders undertake in relation to China. They, they do have a, a Japanese card to play. They have even a minor European card to play uh, in, in these areas. Uh, there's one country you haven't mentioned, Mr. Cameron, Australia. Yes, Australia's uh, relation with the Philippines are perhaps not as strong as those with, the, with Indonesia. It's not a direct neighbor in the same way. Uh, and there's been a, more of a division of responsibility, I think, with the United States in relation to, to, to the Philippines. All right, so uh, an incoming president-elect, the jury's still out as to how he'll do. I want to thank you, uh, David Cameron, Walden Bello for being with us from Bangkok, Nicole Corrado in Manila. Stay with us. Our Media Watch segment is next. And we say hello to James Creedon. Hi, Francois. We've just been look, taking a look at how uh, the, uh, the election in the Philippines has been playing out in media in the Philippines and elsewhere. Um, there has been quite a lot of, uh, I suppose, uh, you could say uh, excitement about the language that has been used, the very colourful language that has been used. It's a family show, James. Watch what you say. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> we'll, have to be, uh, we'll probably have to limit some of what has been said. But in any case, uh, the, the, the rhetoric about smoking, drinking and staying out late being cracked down upon, that's only the, the tip of the iceberg. Really. And womanizing as well. That's right. So it's been it's been pretty pretty colourful stuff. But the I suppose people a lot of people saying that this really was just a strategy to get elected. And in fact, uh, this, is, this is a big story, isn't it? Uh, uh, he's called for this uh, this crackdown on liquor sales, especially in the capital. David Cameron. Yes, I mean that will be something which is rather difficult to impose in 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 the Wild West, which is Manila, or at least some parts of Manila. Uh, indeed. In any case, just to take a look at what some of the media in uh, in the Philippines are saying, he must now uh, change is what one of the major uh, dailies in, in the Inquirer is saying. Occupying the office is not as easy as running for it. The realisation of the, expa of the uh, expanse and gravity of the country's uh, problems must make a Duterte change. He must shift from being an impetuously outspoken idol to a deliberate and deliberative statesman. So they're saying the strategy has worked. In other words, a lot of this was bluster and it wasn't really uh, intended uh, Literally, although uh, I suppose uh, the campaign, uh, in any case, uh, we'll have to see whether whether uh, people are convinced by that. Uh, elsewhere, um, for in terms of the economy, uh, whether or not he can really, uh, you know, take charge of uh, the economic growth in the Philippines, uh, the Inquirer is also saying when Duterte was campaigning for the highest post in the land, a big concern in the business community was his lack of an economic uh, program. He ran and won mainly on the promise to address the peace and order situation and solve God issues. Also, his uh, criticism mm. of uh, the political elite uh, in the Philippines is something that some are saying, well, he's now going to actually have to rule with them. So having been so outspoken in their in criticism of them, he's now going to have to try to uh, build bridges. So there's going to certainly going to have to be a certain amount of changes in his strategy now that he is in office. All right. and, and again, David Cameron, this is where the comparisons with Trump come back is, oh, you know, that's just stuff I said on the campaign trail. 
Yes, but unlike Trump, he has 30 years' experience as a politician. Um, there is concern, however. There were always start, already starting to talk about conspiracy theories that um, the establishment in the Philippines wants, uh, once uh, uh, Lenny Robredo becomes vice president, that they could impeach uh, Duterte in a year or so's time and put one of their own uh, in, in the presidency. That is to replay what happened between Ostrada uh, and Gloria Arroyo. And, and that's rather worrying before the, actual, the, the person has actually be, become president. We're already talking at least rumors about how he, they will attempt to be, unseat him. Well, uh, I suppose just to finish up with a comment from The Economist, Francois, his enthusiasm for vigilante killings shows his preference for order at the expense of law and electing a, a president with, with contempt for the law and democratic norms will solve neither the issues of inclusive growth uh, for growth that will actually uh, benefit the whole, the, more of the society, nor the issue of domination of the country by a small number of families. All right, The Economist editorial there. Many thanks for that, James Creedon. I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.